Morning to all. It is a pleasure as music director to receive you all here and uh, this evening is French to prepare guests here and today is an important day for us because eight years ago a very important day it was D-Day in Normandy, France when the Allies came to recover again Europe so we are talking about freedom and here we are talking about arts and arts is freedom so for me it's a big pleasure have you all here today and special to work again with Gunther, our friends uh, of many projects that we developed together here in the museum and with Cotisera Morin also with this very important project in Cortex also and this is a proof how arts, enterprises and culture bring together leadership, innovation and especially something very special for all it is to promote Portuguese culture and his culture and especially arts a way to engage with communities and a way to celebrate the freedom. So thank you very much. Thank you for the special to have you here today in this big opening of this projects. Thank you. Olá, Fida. Muito bom dia. Uh, aqui é a Guta Borghetes, o Sr. Presidente do Grupo Apoio, o António Guri, a sua família. Pediram-me para a qualidade de vice-presidente da Câmara dar as boas-vindas boas uh, a este momento. E eu, sobretudo, queria agradecer muito. Uh, em primeiro lugar, a iniciativa, cumprimentar pessoas incríveis que estão aqui, o professor Eduardo Sartora, Uh, o Gabriel Calatrava, com quem já tivemos, todo este magnífico painel que hoje vai estar connosco, e dizer que para Lisboa é fantástico, nós, nós ficamos muito estimulados com isso, isto é a cara de Lisboa, uh, escolher uh, aquilo que é poder, aquilo que é inovação e a capacidade de olhar para a cidade e de repensá-la, recuperá-la. Por isso agradecer muito esta oportunidade, dar as boas vidas, estou certo que vai ser um dia fantástico, e hoje não poderia deixar de estar aqui à futura, precisamente para dar as boas-vindas e agradecer este momento. Muito obrigado. Bom dia. Bom dia a todos. Uh, Bem-vindos a Lisboa, bem-vindos ao City Cortex. Uh, penso que é melhor mudar para inglês porque... Temos aqui bastantes convidados de fora e alguns dos participantes da reunião de hoje eh, terão todo o gosto em seguir eh, aquilo que é eh, uma reunião e um projeto que visa ser o mais internacional possível. So, I'll probably change to, to, to English in order so that all of us can follow on a more uh, direct uh, mode. As it was said, this is a special day for Portugal, for Lisbon, for Corticeira Amorim, for Experimenta Design. It's a day in which we give, finally, uh, we became public with a project that we've started some uh, six years ago that was unfortunately interrupted by uh, COVID, which did not allow this project to be presented uh, any earlier. But uh, I think that we feel even more comfortable doing it in Lisbon, having you all around us supporting Portugal, supporting Lisbon, supporting Cork, and that's what Corticera Amorim stands for. We have a mission statement in our company that says that we exist as a, as a company to add value to Cork in a competitive, differentiated, innovative way, always in perfect harmony with nature. And that's basically what Cork stands for. We're talking about one of the most fantastic material materials that nature gives us. Cork is a natural gift of nature. And we believe that it's our role to add value to this incredible material in different shapes and forms because we need to really profit from the intrinsic 
uh, features of cork. We're talking about a uh, material that every cubic centimeter has 40 million cells. We're talking about a uh, material that 70% of its honeycomb structure is air. So it's light, it's resilient, it's resistant. It can really uh, face up to huge temperature differences. That's why the space shuttle and all the space programs, not normally on the satellite launches, use uh, cork. It's a material, and you don't feel it today, but I can feel it now, it's very uh, um, pleasant to touch. Uh, it resists a lot the impact. So we're talking about really a unique uh, product in which Portugal, as we all know, is the, the number one producer in the world. More than 50% of all the cork produced in the world comes from Portugal. And our company and family has been working on this material for the last 154 years. We research, we research more and more. 25 years ago, we have engaged in a line of giving new avenues to cork, increasing the usage of cork. We believe in our company, in our family, that there is a lot more to be discovered, developed with cork than what has been done until today. And this is really what drives us forward. We think that we're very proud of our past, but we think that there is an even greater future ahead of us. We, today, we combine cork with many other materials. We, have de we are developing new technologies. We have created a pilot plant in which we are testing all these new combinations of cork with other composite materials, of cork with different technologies. Basically, we believe uh, we can do a lot with cork. And in design architecture, uh, it's certainly one of the areas where we can uh, amplify the cork uh, uh, usage. We want cork to, to go beyond stoppers for wine. We're very proud of what we, we do for wine consumers in the, in the world. Wine, sparkling wine, spirit consumers with a premium image that cork gives. But we believe that a uh, material that is absolutely unique from a sustainability point of view, don't forget this number, for every single ton of cork produced, it captures 73 tons of CO2. This is absolutely unique from a carbon footprint point of view. We're finalizing some studies to tell you that where we find cork, we find a better, bigger water reservoir on the subsoil. So those are things that really the cork, the cork forest brings to planet Earth. And we as a company, as a family, we are investing recently in uh, forest land. We are planting every year 300 thousand cork trees. We'll be planting in five years almost 1.5 million cork trees. You know it's a species that takes a long time to get its first harvest, but we believe so much in what we're doing that we are ready to invest and wait this long to have the results of this investment. So we, we are prepared to see this product growing, but we need people like the ones that are present in this room today that can take cork to a different level, to a different uh, 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 position. And that's why we have invited Guta and Experimenta Design, which, who, who is a long-term partner of Cork and of Amorim, to really think on a program that could combine uh, the urban development and lifestyle with this unique, versatile, sustainable, natural material that is uh, uh, cork. And this is basically how City Cortex uh, uh, was born. So we're very, very proud to see that we are uh, having some of the most reputed names in the world of design, architecture, uh, with us, supporting product Cork, and we believe that we have converted all of these great personalities in important ambassadors for Cork. And that's basically what we aim with the uh, City Cortex, to make sure that Cork is better known in all its uses and in urban uh, development. And this is why Lisbon makes sense. It was from here that uh, the Portuguese really went on to discover new worlds into this world. And this is why we believe that from Lisbon, with your support, with your enthusiasm, and with uh, such a great material that is cork, we believe we can create absolutely new avenues for the future 
of uh, our industry, for the future of our company and for the future of our country. And if we invest more in Cork, we will be living in a better planet. And this is why we think it makes full sense to launch this project from Lisbon and from the place very close to where our sailors left uh, more than 500 years ago. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for showing up to listen to some of the most uh, relevant names that have endorsed uh, their creativity to Cork. And uh, we're really looking forward to be participating in City Cortex today. Thank you very much. Bom dia a todos. Eu vou começar para português, mas vou mudar depois para inglês. Mas queria dizer as primeiras palavras em português um, para vos dar as boas-vindas uh, para estarem aqui presentes no debate do City Cortex. So I will change quickly to English just to say that City Cortex is designed to be a cultural research project that really thinks about cities, contemporary cities. And how can we use a very extraordinary natural material that is coming from the trees and it's designed to protect the trees in the collective space. So we all know that in 2050, 70% of the population will be living in cities. We all know that we need to redesign the cities to make them more welcoming, to make collective space more, more friendly and engaging differences of cultures, of economic, uh, economical problems, all sorts of issues. So collective space, public space is ours and needs to be inclusive, but also needs to provide protection, comfort, the idea of welcoming, the idea of learning. That's why when we start working with this uh, fantastic group of designers, and the reason why mainly they are Americans is because in the beginning, before COVID, we start talking about New York, and then COVID hit, and then we changed to Lisbon and to, to Trafaria to make the, the project. Um, but we start talking about what are the main issues that you think uh, when we think about the future of the cities. So we believe that designers and architects, but also citizens, are the most important um, key players in this discuss discussion, but also politicians and managers and companies. That's why we feel so happy to see a company such as Amurim to really invest in a project that took five years to develop, that um, allowed the creative people to really think about and learn about material, to really think about their own proposals. And that's why during this day, we're going to see eight installations joining for the first time the two sides of the river um, with this cultural connection. And it's also a historical connection. So we are talking about recovering this connection with the other side of the river. And we're going to see eight proposals that really are, is bring, are bringing the cork, the idea of protection, the idea of comfort, the idea of welcoming, the idea of health to public space. It's also going to be a challenge for citizens because cork as an opposition to concrete or as an opposition to um, iron is a very soft and warming and emotional material. So we truly believe that this material can change people's behavior and can protect them and can establish new relations in between people. So those are the ambitious goals of, of uh, City Cortex. Um, and of course, I do thank you, um, the Museo Nacional dos Cors, for wel welcoming us again here to listen to this debate. And now I seriously advise you to pay attention to this conversation uh, between our um, creative um, team and Shumon Bazar, but I will also like to add that um, then in each opening of each installation, each of the creators, each of the designers will explain a bit of, of the project on site. So it's with an enormous pleasure that I would like to call Shumon Bazar, our moderator, Gabriel Shumon, <laughs> Gabriel Calatrava, <laughs> Yves Bear, <laughs> Stefan Zagmeister, Dominique Leon, Liz Diller, Eduard Sotomora. Thank you so much. Hello. Hi. Hi, hi, hi. Good morning. Uh, 
Guta said, my name is Shumon Basar. It's a real pleasure to be here um, with uh, all of you and uh, with all of us. Uh, firstly, I would like to thank uh, Guta for the invita this uh, amazing invitation to celebrate the opening of City Cortex, uh, a cultural research program that explores the intersection between contemporary urban context and one of the most uh, versatile and sustainable raw materials that nature has to offer cork, as we, as we just heard. Um, and I think, I mean, uh, this is my first time in Lisbon, so I'm also, uh, as much as I am uh, excited to be Thank here, uh, I also am humble because I have uh, everything to learn, and this is such an amazing opportunity uh, uh, to learn about the city through this, uh, through this project and through the various projects uh, that you'll be learning about this morning. Um, so I, I mention that because uh, as a disclaimer, I am neither uh, therefore an expert in Lisbon and certainly not an expert in Cork, um, but uh, I, I have been writing about cities, uh, the way that they encode history and also declare the future using attention and destruction, uh, and I've been doing this for a long time. So to me, what is interesting about City Cortex and what I would like to discuss with our protagonists this morning, beyond the specifics of how they've approached their commissions, is what our faith in cities should be and could be. What is symptomatic of this part of the 21st century with all its environmental, economic, technological, and cultural upheavals? And are complexities and contradictions actually opportunities in disguise? So it's worth uh, reminding ourselves, and here I have Guta to thank, that the word cortex comes from a Latin declination, which means bark or cork. But most of us, certainly myself, would have heard of this word uh, in the past as it relates to the brain, the protective barrier that grants survival, providing it with resistance and stability. And I think these are really interesting, also important words, no? Survival, resistance, stability. Survival, resistance, stability. So at a time when so-called natural intelligence is being compared to and for some, threatened by artificial intelligence, questions of input versus output, information versus wisdom, progress versus regression, these have all become paramount, not only as abstract academic pursuit that might take place in the university, but these are rewiring our very inner and outer realms. So um, I'm going to introduce our, briefly introduce our guest uh, this morning. Um, also, another disclaimer, uh, I normally have a rule when I do this kind of thing that a conversation should never be more than three people. Uh, I'm breaking a rule <laughs> for Guta and for the project, um, but it does come with certain structural challenges. <laughs> Um, and, you know, so what I really want to try and avoid this morning is uh, are the kind of cardinal sins that happen when you gather a lot of people in a, in, in a, in a row like this with a very limited amount of time. Um, so I, I'm going to try my absolute swearing best to uh, keep this as dynamic, but also as, as sort of specific and general as possible. Uh, because, as I'm sure you all know, a good conversation should be no larger than a good uh, dinner party. Um, so hopefully this will be a very good dinner party without a dining table, clearly. <laughs> um, so on stage with me, we have Eduardo Soto de Moro, who needs little introduction, except to say he's one of the most renowned architects of his generation, winning the Pritzker Prize in 2011 and defining Portuguese contemporary architecture since the early 1980s onwards. We have Liz Diller from Diller, Scafidio, and Renfrew, a New York-based design studio 
now over four decades running, known for their influential cultural projects such as the High Line in New York, the Broad in Los Angeles, as well as numerous collaborations with choreographers, dramatists, and artists. Gabriel Calatrava is a structural engineer and architect by training who co-founded Col Collaborative Architecture Laboratory in New York. Aside from working extensively with his father, Santiago, Gabriel's projects have included an apartment at the MoMA Towers and renovating the entrance of an old classic cast iron factory building in Tribeca. Dominic Leong from Leong Leong, uh, they have offices in New York and in Los Angeles, and they've completed projects in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Seoul, Venice, and the Napa Valley, employing strategic thinking and also material experimentation, which we'll talk about today. Yves Bahar, Bahar established Fuse Project in San Francisco in 1999, which has focused on industrial and digital design, strategy, branding, and innovation with clients such as Herman Miller, Samsung, Issey Miyake, and Prada. And last but not least, uh, at the far end, um, we have Stefan Sagmeister, who's here representing Sagmeister and Walsh, which was a collaboration between Stefan and Jessica Walsh uh, that lasted roughly between 2012 and 2019. Uh, and so, and I'm sure Stefan will talk about this, uh, the, the projects here bear a kind of historical relationship to that relationship that you've had with Jessica. Um, but Stefan, in his own right, of course, is a, uh, is a world famous graphic designer and, commun and his communication work is known the world over. Uh, and he also recently co-directed a documentary called uh, The Happy Film. So will you please uh, join me in welcoming our guest today? Thank you. So I have two rounds of questions, maybe a third if we have enough time. The third one is a speed round. Um, but the first round of questions uh, that I'm going to um, pose our guests is really about their various approaches to the City uh, Cortex brief and how they've experimented uh, with, this, uh, with this material. Um, so I would like to start with Eduardo. So Eduardo, you have once said, quote, I don't like to explain how the process works, end quote. So I'm not going to ask you about your process in your City Cortex proposal, but I would like to ask you why you chose to introduce a double-sided chair for conversation and silence in this specific part of the city. And um, if you could tell us the, the title that you've given to your project. And, um, and yes, so why a double-sided chair and in this specific part of Lisbon? Bom, antes de mais, queria agradecer o convite que foi feito a todas as entidades à Guta, que não é uma entidade, é uma amiga minha, e a conhecer a Amorim quer um, quer outro, são incansáveis no seu trabalho. E é, e é importante uh, agradecer porque qualquer evento que há... Forgot about that part. Eles são, elas estão com uma eficiência que não é fácil encontrar em Portugal. Eficiência e, e, e disponibilidade. Bom, portanto agradeço. Não, não agradeço a mais entidades porque vou-me esquecer e depois é, é desagradável. Portanto... Uh, O meu processo de trabalho, não sei, porque não, nem, não sei falar de mim próprio, mas po posso explicar como é que fiz aquela peça. Portanto, combinámos com a Ruta, uh, encontramos no, nas escadas do mate, em frente ao rio, para conversar sobre este evento e este tema. Eu tenho um problema de pulmões, fumei muito, trabalhei, fumei os meus e os de Lisa, porque trabalhei 30 anos com Lisa. Agora parei, há 20 anos que não fumo, mas tenho dificuldades em respirar. Quando cheguei ao sítio, queria me sentar e não havia nenhum sítio para me sentar. Então disse, vou fazer uma cadeira. <risos> Depois de me sentar, imaginado, sentei-me nos degraus, falei com a Guta, ela explicou-me e... E havia outro problema, que era o vento. A vista era muito bonita, onde há água à beleza, geralmente. E 
precisava de sentar, mas que houvesse alguma proteção. Rapidamente, em, em estilo flash, tive uma ideia, que era fazer uma, uma estrutura em chapa, em ferro, e que deveria ser depois revestida com material, um material agradável, fundamentalmente ao tato e à, e à vista. O, o material é notável, já usei a cortiça, fiz, colaborei no pavilhão de Portugal em Hanover, toda em cortiça, depois foi, foi transferido para Coimbra, para Portugal, e penso que a cortiça continua a resistir. Fundamentalmente a cortiça é muito agradável ao tato. Eu descobri isso quando visitei a casa da cascata do Frank Lloyd Wright e os quartos de banho são todos revestidos a cortiça. Então, não, não entrei para a banheira, mas imaginei que era agradável estar a tomar um banho num chuveiro e não ter aquela sensação fria do mármore. E penso que essa cortiça também é impermeável. Foi uma experiência agradável, tão agradável que cheguei atrasada à cerimónia para receber o preto. Sobre esta peça, posso dizer que eu, eu parto do princípio da necessidade. Eu sou, sou, sou arquiteto, não sou artista. E a arquitetura, no, no, neste momento, não é uma forma de arte. Funciona mais como um médico. Me dizem, há um problema. O que é que... Qual é a questão? explica uma questão e eu, eu tento resolvê-la. E tento resolvê-la quantitativamente pela função. Sei perfeitamente que não chega e que depois vai acontecer coisas posteriores, mas não dependem de mim. Depende do coletivo, vocês todos, como é que aderem, usam e transformam. A partir da a noção de arte em arquitetura não é, não é voluntária e geralmente, se é voluntária, dá um disparate. Portanto, a arte acontece e não é uma vocação pessoal. Portanto, acho que está explicado. Já uma vez tinha feito uma conversadeira em mármore e agora, sempre que a Guta me pede um objeto, eu vou fazer, penso, para o futuro, a conversadeira 3. É, é importante para mim de sentar-me, mas penso que cada vez mais o mundo melhora, porque quando se conversa e se fala. Os grandes problemas é que não se conversa ou não se fala hoje em dia. Ou fala-se no telemóvel. Pronto, não tenho mais a dizer, só queria agradecer que tive imenso gosto de fazer esta peça, porque é rápida, o processo é eficiente, não temos que esperar infinitamente pelos projetos. Hoje em dia os projetos, se eu vice-presidente, não é nenhuma crítica, mas chegamos a acordo, chegamos a acordo com o cliente, não é fácil, chegamos a acordo com os engenheiros, não é fácil. Para se fazer uma casa, precisamos de seis ou sete engenheiros, pois preços, os bancos, os colaboradores, e ficamos cansados porque demora tudo muito. Eu gosto de fazer estas, estas, estas exceções, exceções de verão, em que tudo se passa rapidamente e é um processo fresco, leve e rápido. Coisa, coisa que hoje na arquitetura não tem. Obrigado a todos. Thank you, uh, thank you, Eduardo. And you actually answered the second part of a question that I was going to have, which is where in the same interview you had said, I never start things from scratch. Um, you never start things from zero. Uh, projects are often a response to projects that you've already begun. So it's interesting to hear that this is your third chair. So um, Liz, next, please. Um, your proposal is called Second Skin. Um, and this relates, uh, I think, to my understanding, to this cortex metaphor, in a way, that we, I just mentioned, no, regarding both the tree, but also the, this idea of uh, the sort of body organs. So could you tell us um, what is the first skin uh, around, around which this second skin is wrapped? Well, of course it's and the what are the cultural ambitions for this project that you've done here in Lisbon? So um, starting with cork as a prompt and as a primary material, um, we couldn't help but think about um, you know, where cork comes from, uh, the source, the site, the source as the site, and potentially um, what else that site provides. So from um, trees comes cork, from uh, trees come um, comes paper um, and books. 
and books are the social connect connectivity. So when there are when there's more than sort of one axis, you know, there, there's the axis of the material, there's the axis of sight, there's the axis of um, this cultural endeavor, um, then the project sort of congealed. Uh, we, we started Guta when Guta uh, came to us maybe five years ago. Uh, the project was cited for the New York Public Library. And, um, and it was to be a, um, an open reading room. Um, and in New York, uh, so the very, very first inspiration uh, about this public reading room was that um, we would somehow have each tree um, uh, uh, sort of be the center of a theme, of a particular theme. And it was always about literacy. And in New York, there's something like 800 languages spoken, and, and we thought, well, perhaps we start with like the most translated book there is in the world, like Don Quixote in 300 languages. That was like the, the, the very start of it, and Little Prince and, and so forth. Um, and then the project just evolved into different thematics around um, trees and around reading and publicness. And I, I think, if, you know, just to back up um, one more step, uh, I and my studio are very interested in the publicness of public spaces and what they mean. Um, and I live in a city that's very real estate oriented um, and uh, uh, very much um, pri privatized all the time, spaces privatized. So protecting um, public space from uh, uh, greedy, greedy real estate developers is sort of one of the most important things I do. Um, and then uh, when we have a chance to actually do more than provide, protect and provide private space, actually program it, is really fun uh, for us. So, so that's where it comes from. And just uh, briefly, and you, talk, you use this word, I think, which for me, I'm, I've been thinking about this a lot, which is literacy, right? Yeah. So, and I wanted to ask you about leading, reading and literacy, because these are things that are always evolving. Right? So, and literacy is not just about whether you can uh, read uh, text, right? We have um, media literacy, image literacy, you know, all kinds of literacies today. But I'm, I'm curious because I was, um, I remember actually 20 years ago, I went to Seattle for the opening of OMA's Seattle Public Library, right. which was this incredible public event. Mm -hmm. 18,000 people queued to get inside. Wow. Partly because, and I remember asking them because I was writing about it, they felt a sense of ownership. So, you know, a, a, a tax had been levied on everybody in Seattle to, to, to pay for the library. So when it opened, they really felt like it belonged to them. You know, all the furniture was sort of destroyed after a year because it had been so well used. Hmm. Now, our friend hans Ulrich Obrist went very recently, um, and I haven't been in 20 years. And then his report was, it couldn't be more different, no? He said, sadly... It's mostly homeless people now. Oh, wow. And, you know, people weren't using uh, the library because, again, literacy has changed. You know? right. I just read a piece in, in, uh, uh, last night about how academic, um, professors and academics are bemoaning, bemoaning the fact that their students don't read books anymore, right? So reading has evolved. And, but then I was in, um, in Doha a few months ago, and then Rem gave, gave me a tour of uh, the National Public Library, yeah. and it was packed. Completely packed, you know. So I was giving him this thesis that you know we our library's relevant today, and he was like, "Well, it's self-evident." No, so obviously that question of reading and literacy and books, the centrality of books versus screens and information. So there's something provocative, even in a, a small project like yours, to make a library of books at a time where um, most reading, in a way, or not even reading, it's more it's a form of pattern recognition. I think how we look at screens today. So could you say something about that question of like responding to the contemporaneity of what literacy has become today? And, and does this say something about your continued faith in books, I guess? <laughs> I, I, I suppose I'm, I'm nostalgic for yeah. books and I, I like paper and, and I collect books and, and I even collect newspapers, you know. Um, and uh, I know it's a fire hazard, um, but... Uh, you know, there's something about the institution of the library that's still sacred uh, for me. It's, it's, and even, even if libraries aren't in, used exactly as intentioned um, as public spaces, 
uh, where people are quiet, you know, even researchers with their laptops in a library, you know, where it really doesn't matter, they're not pulling books. Um, there's something about the institution of the library which protects knowledge, um, you know, freedom of speech and knowledge. And, and so, you know, I mean, just thinking about that, one of our themes was banned books, mm. you know, when we were thinking about different kinds of things that we could put into this uh, outdoor reading room. Um, so I, I, I do feel somewhat nostalgic. I was just speaking um, uh, two nights ago with uh, um, a very well-known uh, doctor, and, um, <clears throat> and we were just talking about books and medicine, and uh, <laughs> books are disappearing. They're entirely disappearing because the knowledge is already outdated mm. um, for, for teaching. So, you know, all the very old historic texts are still there, but, you know, anything from the 20th century is, is pretty much uh, uh, gone and it's replaced every year. So, um, and that comes back to literacy, that literacy doesn't necessarily mean, you know, um, it, knowledge is constantly being refreshed. So, um, it's kind of a, it's a, it's a problem, like yes. how do you preserve knowledge that may not be entirely relevant and, of course, in literature, that doesn't really matter. Yeah. But when it comes to, um, you know, professional uh, books and, 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 and certain kinds of expertise, um, books are not necessarily, you know, the best vehicle for those. So it's something to contemplate. Thank you. you know, there's so much I, I would love to discuss here. But I'm going to move on to Eve now. So your site here is Belém, um, a historical part of, uh, historically, a point of entry and exit for the city. And I believe you've been inspired by the 16th century Torre de Belém. Mm -hmm. um, so how has this notion of threshold uh, and transition translated into your intervention? And could you tell us, because I know you've, you've really honed in on some very specific qualities of the court yeah. um, to, create a sort of, to create the experience in your proposal. Thank you. So for me, context is very important, and I've lived uh, about half my time in Lisbon for the last three years. So I really want, you know, sort of am uh, close to this notion of entry. Uh, uh, Lisbon is a, is a river that is accessed from the ocean and um, the towers were there for protection um, and today they're a welcoming uh, element. So context and the, the city itself was very important and the tower is very symbolic in that way. The other thing I was interested in is the material intelligence. And you talked about intelligence earlier. You know, human intelligence is variable um, at best. <laughs> and, um, but material intelligence is always there. And as was noted earlier, um, Cork has incredible sort of capabilities and it's being innovated on these days by MRM. Um, and so what I was interested in is the intelligence of this material, and which is sensory, you know, it's obviously it's sustainable, etc. <laughs> but it's a very sensory uh, material. And so as an industrial designer, I thought about the tower, but I also thought about the tactility, um, the change in temperature, the change in sound and landscape, um, and so the tower, when you go inside it, becomes a calming place. You can look at the sky a little bit like a James Turrell. Um, you can, um, you, the, the sound is abated and a lot, uh, it's, it's a lot calmer and peaceful. The temperature goes down by a few degrees. It's hot in Lisbon in, in this time of the year. Um, and so I was interested in really communicating the fact that this is a material from the past, which is the material of the future, um, and really providing people with um, that, um, that knowledge, I guess, or that understanding of, um, of the intelligence of the material. Thank you, amazing. Uh, Gabrielle, I'd like to ask you about uh, your project. It takes place, it's the only project that's on the other side of, uh, uh, of, of the water in a so public plot of land in Trafaria. Um, and it's called uh, Ondos, right? Correct? Correct. So could you tell us how you've brought together your interest in unused spaces, temporary occupation, to create a new kind of community, 
And what role do useless old chairs play in this, please? <laughs> um, so yeah. um, when the project started, my team and I sat down. It was uh, meant to be in New York City, so kind of the thought pattern on how we developed our concept uh, started and originated in New York City, especially down in the Lower East Side and the East Village, where there's a phenomenon that happens in which uh, because the land was cheap, the developers developed spec buildings, which were kind of um, pre-designed buildings that you would put up, and it wasn't worth adjusting the building to the lot size to maximize the land. So what happens is, as a result of all this, is that there's these slivers that get left behind that are, you know, maybe a meter and a half sometimes, even sometimes two meters, sometimes only half a meter wide. And so um, the beginning of, <clears throat> of all this thought of using kind of this public space, and as Liz uh, mentioned, you know, the, the publicness of public space and how we can protect it or expand on it uh, uh, was, was, was a thought that we were preoccupied and how could we kind of weave in a cork structure in between those two buildings. So that was kind of the beginning of using kind of maybe expanding the public realm, using spaces that have been neglected, uh, kind of trying to expand that, that, that uh, public good. So <clears throat> when uh, we were uh, given the site, we looked at it very carefully, and Traferia has a really interesting past because it's a predominantly a, a place where immigrants come in and settle into the city. So we thought there has to be some kind of um, use of court that we could do, uh, that we could implement in order to improve uh, the lives of, of people who are coming in, who maybe don't speak the language. And the best way to do that in our thought was to expand the public space so that gathering could happen. And so <clears throat> from that thought, we started looking at what does a public space need? And especially if you use just a plot of land, what do you need to performatively uh, give to that uh, piece of land so that people actually use it? And, and the intelligence of materials came along and Cork having all these physical properties that are incredible, such as, you know, insulation, uh, heat rejection, sound absorption. I mean, there's an endless amount of applications on cork. It's kind of a miracle material. And so we looked at the physical properties of how cork performs and how it scientifically kind of uh, gives us an edge in order to create a public space. So one of which was the um, infrared spectrum absorption and rejection of cork is incredibly large. So through the... Um, I'm going to be a little bit of a nerd, but uh, through, 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 through the uh, um, electromagnetic spectrum, cork rejects infrared very, very high. And infrared is basically the spectrum part that heats you up. So given that this, this uh, climate tends to vary in the winter, it's relatively pleasant. In the summer, it gets quite warm. We wanted to create a canopy of shade in order to be able to activate that space. And then from there, we thought, you know, how great would it be instead of doing a public space that's hardscaped, we think of it as softscaped, and uh, in order to make up for the lack of vegetation. And um, so that was it. And the furniture part was how do we protect it? And uh, one of the ways and one of the strategies which I think are quite effective is how do you engage the community? And so we thought, you know, we could bring in furniture and recycle it and just show the versatility of cork by having the community come in and spray furniture pieces that could be constantly recycled out into, given that things break. As you mentioned with the uh, Seattle Library, you know, furniture goes, gets used and hopefully, you know, used well, and then that has a life cycle itself. So we thought, how can you keep that, um, how can you keep that mechanism, uh, you know, integrated into like, a useful future? And so we thought, you know, there's all these chairs that get discarded all the time and all this waste that we produce, can we recycle, can cork be a thing that we can spray and just upvalue uh, 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 a piece that would have been naturally discarded and then use that as this constant kind of supply. Um, into and also maybe just last thing, um, to, to, uh, and I have to keep things moving. Of course. It's become, it's going to be permanent now, yeah? Yeah, we were very, it was a surprise to us. It was very, uh, it was, uh, it was a great surprise. It's a great honor to have something permanent uh, here in Lisbon, and, and you know, probably the most exciting city in the world right now. Uh, and 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 so uh, we were greatly honored uh, that it, that our concept got adopted by by the by the municipality of Traferia. So.
Amazing. Thank, Thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Uh, Dominic, I'd like to ask you about your project, which is called LilyPad. Um, so you've experimented with transforming the cork uh, thermally, which tr also transforms its qualities. Can you tell us about this approach that you took uh, and what the results of this experiment are? Because it does feel like a kind of experiment that you've mm. undertook here with the material. So what, the what is the relationship between the, these material experimentations of material intelligence that Eve was talking about um, and then the specific forms uh, that they've taken, please? Yeah. Yeah, I think we were really inspired to work on this project partly because it started with the material and oftentimes that's a little bit part of our design process, its relationship to materiality. Um, and when we began thinking about the project in the context of New York, um, we were thinking about public space and the legacy of modernism in public space. And I think as, as Liz mentioned, New York um, does have this interesting um, privately owned public space concept, which was such a defining kind of urban typology within the history of Manhattan. And so we were considering um, that legacy. Um, in a lot of ways, the material environment of these sort of plazas in front of Chase Manhattan or the Seagram building, um, and also the presence of what has sort of been termed plop art, these sort of amazing um, large sculptural um, um, elements that punctuated this urban space and sort of suggested a, 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 a kind of cultural presence within this otherwise um, um, sort of corporate modernism backdrop. Um, and we were really thinking about um, a kind of counterpoint to that um, and thinking about what does it mean to welcome bodies into that space and different kinds of bodies. So the prompt of play and city um, was really something that we started to think about relative to not so much like a sculptural figure, but more of an adaptable landscape that um, became a kind of weird hybrid between uh, urban furniture and a playscape. So we were thinking about Noguchi's intervention at Chase Manhattan. Um, and that sort of open-ended uh, notion of an urban landscape. And I think the other, the other thread, which might get back to your point, is um, I, I used to skateboard a lot. So my, one of my first um, relationships to the city was through skateboarding. And it really was an introduction, like an introduction of play in this urban environment and also encountering different um, elements of architecture and furniture that were, you know, essentially playgrounds. But one of the elements that became very noticeable are these sort of, um, it's called defensible space. So you can see a bench and there'll be little, you know, elements that prevent people from skating, skating on it um, or sleeping on it. Um, and we were also thinking about, you know, what is the relationship between um, bodies and the plurality of bodies in the city and how do they find, um, how do they find comfort or rest? And in a lot of ways, this project was about creating an indefensible um, playscape that it's not about defending a space, it's actually about opening up possibilities in a space for different bodies to find comfort. And so whether it's seating or just even, maybe our project actually is more conducive to laying. So I you know, saw these photos of when it was installed and just the images of people laying on it. Um, it was really kind of uh, exciting, also relative to the landscape and this water's edge. And so in a lot of ways, the cork was, um, from a material point of view, um, also a way to um, kind of create a tactility or even warmth that um, almost like, as if you'd want to touch it or lay on it in a very simple way. And so the project is sort of situated um, both as part of the landscape, but also part of the city. and. Um, looking at both the scale of the cork protocols and how it would scale up to essentially an aggregation of lily pads that almost creates a landscape or individual kind of seating elements. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we've got eight minutes left. Uh, and Ste but Stefan has three projects. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to kind of um, race through this. But yes, so Stefan, you and Jessica um, have made three interventions of different sort of scales and nature. So maybe we could run through each of these, uh, and I'm sure you can talk about them more when we visit them. But the first one I'd like to ask about is life expectancy. Um, 
So it's uh, um, uh, in a pedestrian underpass, obviously not far from here. Um, and could you tell us about, um, yeah, the, the sort of intentions behind this um, and uh, both, and then how it's been materialized? Um, and then we'll talk about the other two um, uh, projects, Humpback and Cork Bottles. But first, life expectancy, please, Stefan. Thank you. Well, the, the last five years, we've really been exclusively working on things that have to do with long-term thinking. Mostly because of the insight that as media cycles get much shorter, they also become much more negative. The shorter the cycle, the more negative the news, because catastrophes and scandals happen to, go, happen, to happen very quickly, while things develop that develop well, develop very slowly. And so this has been, you know, I see myself as a communication designer, has been really central because so many very smart people that I know, friends, but also acquaintances, think that the world is getting worse and worse and terrible, which is provably 100% not true and is unbelievably dangerous because shit like make America great again only works when everybody believes everything is shit and stuff used to be much better in the past. So this has basically been the center of everything we try to communicate and in this case it's an underpass that you might just walk through and know nothing and possibly have your experience increased by a tiny little bit simply because there is no more echo because as we've heard now, Cork is very sound absorbing and echoes in an underpass, I always felt are contributing to a fear factor, specifically if you go through it at night. But if you actually figure out or go through the trouble of looking up and figuring out the sentence, the sentence will actually say, if a newspaper would only appear every 50 years, the headline for sure would be that our life expectancy increased by 20 years. And which never is the headline because it just happens to move so very, very slowly and it always falls out of regular newspaper <laughs> stories. So uh, that's one. And then the other one, that floating mat that we designed goes in a is within that same cycle of works. Basically, it's all about the small successes that we can celebrate also as far as the environmental uh, world is concerned. This is not out of a belief that everything is great and we should do nothing. It's actually the opposite. But it's out of a knowledge that right now 50% of all young people between 16 and 25 think that humanity will end. So these guys don't do anything. They're depressed in their room and they're not really working what we need them to work on as in you know, facing the, challenging, the challenges that we need to face. So I think when we looked at how big social changes were achieved in the last 20 years, let's say the unbelievable success of the no smoking campaigns, they were achieved by positive and negative reinforcements, as in positive, you're going to save some money, but here are the really terrible pictures, what's going to happen to your body on the cigarette pack. And I believe that if we're going to face the many, 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 many challenges that need to be faced, we need the whip and the carrot. And right now, both social media and traditional media, all being super short term, deliver lots and lots of the whip. 
So what we try to do is create a little bit of the carrot, and in this case, once you see that floating device, it's actually created in some sort of pattern that shows that humpback whales actually recovered very nicely in the last two decades that we have, you know, went from 10,000 alive to 25,000 alive. Just one of the small successes. Thank you. And we're running out of time, so unfortunately, I don't have time to go into my um, second round of uh, questions, but maybe we'll find another opportunity. But I am going to skip to my last round, and you set it up perfectly, Stefan. This is a speed round. It's going to take a minute. Um, but you mentioned the future, and, and I want to ask everybody about the future. Um, you mentioned, for example, that uh, very young, often very young people, uh, don't feel a sense of future, no? for ver various very tangible reasons. Uh, and this has been summed up in a phrase, you know, that is now a meme, which is, you know, the future has been cancelled, right, which is uh, a sort of Mark Fisher sort of meme. Um, in a book that I did with Douglas Coupland and hans Ulrich Obrist called The Age of Earthquakes, we said, you know the future is happening when you start feeling scared. Um, so I want to ask everybody, um, does the future scare you or excite you? Or is it a secret third thing? No long answers. Scared, excited, something else. So, Stefan, scared, well, excited. If I would have a time machine, 100% I would go into the future, no doubt. Uh, oh, I'm totally excited about it. It's, uh, I'm very happy of being 61 years old. But the only disadvantage of that is that I'm not going to be alive in 100 years because... We don't know that yet, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very curious. Amazing. Um, Gabriel, scared, excited, very something excited, else? Very excited. Very, very excited. I think that there's going to be more change in the next 10 years than the last 50, and I'm very excited to see that happen. Amazing. Uh, Eve, scared, excited, something else? <clears throat> I'm excited because there is no... Um, other option. If you're <laughs> <laughs> I gave you options. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the other option is to be negative and to be depressed. Um, and, you know, one, one thing that I learned yesterday is the difference between the top five tennis players in the world and the other 100 of the ATP. They, 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 they analyze the difference. And the difference is that after every shot, whether it's a miss or a win, they think positively about the next shot, about the next uh, part of the game. And so the only way for us to progress, to win uh, at the highest level, is to think in a positive fashion, um, whether things are temporarily negative or not, uh, to think that we can do great in the next stage. So that's why I don't have a choice. Got it. Liz, scared, excited, something else? Future. Uh, excited in, in general um, and scared, but uh, one, <laughs> little, one tiny little anecdote. I was in a team building session that I was forced to participate in with 100 people. And, um, and everyone had to secretly um, uh, say whether they would um, prefer to spend one day 100 years in the past or one day 100 years in the future. And when they calculated, you know, the 100 um, submissions, 99 said, go one day into the past. Mm. And I was the only one that said one day into the future, wow. 100 years into the future, even though it's scary. Mm -hmm. But that, but that says something, you know, I don't know, I don't know what that says. Most people... That says a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that says a lot. I mean, it's very much make America great again. It's <laughs> um, and Eduardo, last obviously, but not least, are you scared, excited, something else about the future? Eu esqueci-me de explicar, quando você me perguntou, porque é que escolhi aquele sítio. Portanto, eu escolhi um sítio, que estão dois edifícios, um em tijolo e um em pedra. E o importante é a junta. Por isso é que eu fiz uma conversadeira. São dois, dois materiais diferentes, dois edifícios diferentes, têm um comportamento diferente. Um é natural, que é pedra, e o outro é social, que é tijolo. 
e a junta é onde se passa tudo. E como há um ditado português que diz, a virtude está no meio. Eu disse, então vou desenhar a virtude. Então fiz um agrafo para segurar os dois, que em princípio têm tensões diferentes. Isto enquadra-se no futuro. A mim interessa-me é que, através de, do discurso, do, do conversar e da maneira como as energias de cada material, nem sou ecologista a dizer o que me interessa é a natureza, nem sou 100% de arquiteto a dizer o que me interessa é o, é o botão. Um precisa do outro e, portanto, decidi fazer um agrafo. Isto é a primeira questão. Quanto ao futuro, não estou nada preocupado. O Einstein dizia, o futuro chega sempre demasiado depressa. Quando chegar, vou tratar dele dia a dia, hora a hora, minuto a minuto. E acredito que sou otimista. Get excited, something else. Uh, I would say something else, and maybe my version of that would just to maybe offer a different idea of time. That, you know, the assumption that time is linear, that we're moving in one direction, but that that is one specific understanding of in other worldviews. Think of the future is in the past, the patches in the future, so leave it on that philosophical note. Fantastic. Uh, we have run out of time, uh, but please join me in thanking all our amazing guests. Thank you very much.